But until you're being healed of something in your lungs right now Amen. because of the word. Amen. Just, just because of that word spoken. Amen. And I believe the guy, because immediately upon me touching his back and saying those words, he coughed. Um, so it's not up to me to say, okay, now you want to go to your church, give a testimony, and no. Um, that, that, that matters, but it's not necessary. Um, we get stuck in our heads sometimes of how it happens. That's why I don't believe that Jesus ever followed a pattern on how it's to happen. He, he spit on the ground, made some mud. That would be freaky. Um, on the eyes, sticking his fingers in ears, you know. Um, in the Old Testament, telling somebody to go wash in the Jordan River, you know, which is a real muddy creek at this point of where they were at. Thank you, Randy. For <laughs> Thanks for getting healed right in front but, of us. Yeah, <laughs> but that's enough. We'll take it. <laughs> that's enough healing. Yeah. Nah. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, Terry, grab him a, a water and bring it up. It's okay, buddy. Anybody. We, got, we got you covered. Anybody. Any servant. So, uh, so when we say things like that, just know that we want to go into the community and meet their need by the Lord telling you. You're the ambassador, not the person. We're not to judge right here. We're not to... Uh, uh, Thank you. If we go out in a religious spirit trying to show how, you know, well, it's because of this that you're sick, or ex try, we try to explain way too much, you know, Instead of just saying that, yeah, I don't, God's yeah I don't know what's happened. I don't know why. Because Jesus was asked the same thing in a very religious way. Who sinned? His, his father, you know, his father and his mother are the child who sinned. And, you know, we're always looking to, we want to put our finger on what's going on or why. And Jesus said neither. He was like this so he could make the, the works of God manifest, you know, the power of God. So whatever's going on in the community, the Bible says that the whole community, the whole world is under the charge or the uh, um, control of the evil one for right now, right? And so us knowing that, I just know this. Circumstance happened. Poo happened, if you will. That's in the Greek. Um, so so living, living life, this guy stepped in poo, hurt his shoe, and now he needs healing. So all he needs is Jesus with his hands on him, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I'm that ambassador, then that's all I have to do. I don't have to give him a sermon or track or anything like that. It's just God desires to have you whole because he so loved the world that he gave his only son. He didn't judge the world, didn't condemn the world. He just so loves it. And I, I think if, if we... I, and they are pre-Christians, by the way. They are not heathen. They are not unsaved. They are pre-Christians. Everything's been made available for their salvation and yours. Right? So they are pre-Christian. Yeah. I think part of what we're going to do... I have no idea where all that came from. I know. So. We just preached our whole <laughs> message. But anyway, uh, all we have to do this week and next week is have your attention so you can see the direction of where we want to go, how we fit that into September, you'll have to stay tuned. But, but, but um, the idea of what we are as a church and what we're moving forward in and what we want to put our energies and our, and our talents in is you'll hear in these next two messages. And so if you're even remotely interested in being invested here, you're going to want to be here for the next two sessions because we're just going to set a course of what our heart is. And so, um, you know, in this debate when we're talking about September, of course, we've talked about everything, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and we've had incredible cleansing conversations, mm -hmm. and we want to kind of make that really clear to you next week. <laughs> but tonight, we will, or today, we will be, um, is this thing working? I have, yeah, that's working. That, I know, I don't I know no what idea happened there. Coming up. Yeah. You got my clicker on? Yep, there you go. Okay, um, the message is called Sex, Lies, and Restoration, and we want to just take a moment to tell you, and give you just a snapshot of how far we've fallen away from what God's given us. I love the songs that we sang today um, uh, about, I will pursue your presence. You know, sometimes our church calls our church to a fast, and some people don't even have time for that. And the fast is not to control you or to have some kind of lording over you. It's to really give you a moment to say, calibrate. Where are you with him? How busy are you? If you can't dial down and turn the TV off, and I could care less if you don't eat. That's not my goal. My goal is to see, are you in the direction where God would have you? And so when we do that, we give you time to pursue his presence because life gets really busy, doesn't it? Well, when we talk about sex, lies, and restoration, you're going to see clearly that you are so steeped in a culture that is, and, and it's become very common for us. And I want to bring it to your attention because um, we have these beautiful young girls in our community that I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they understand how valuable they are and how holy they are to God because I didn't have anybody impart that to me. 
And as a result, I didn't know how valued I was. And we're going to do everything we can to empower the godmothers, the mothers, the aunts, the people that are here to be able to impart this to their children, not only their girls, but more importantly, their boys. And so I have a ministry that I'd like to start today. I'm going to launch it, and it's going to spur somebody's heart. And the one that is triggered by this ministry, I'm going to ask you to help me help this generation of boys see God's purpose fully filled in their life. So we're going to spend a little bit of time listening to some other testimonies, but let's start the story with this. We want to know the lies that Satan tells us pertaining to sex. So first off, it starts in the garden. It's gorgeous. They're naked and unashamed. God creates family. His whole purpose is for us to have family, and, and sex is part of that. The, the, um, the, um, the garden, Eden, means delight and pleasure. And when Adam found no suitable maker, God laid him down, created one for himself, and now the two were going to be the greatest reflection of God. They are one together. Mm -hmm. So a man and a woman make a complete picture of who God is. And so their joy was as they were now going to populate the earth for God's family. And so you'll see that it was atmospherically perfect. There is no shame. They could experiment and love with each other and create with each other. They literally were in partnership with God in creation. He says, I love creating so much that I'm going to give you the ability to do it as well. You are really going to reflect me. Um, we know what happens. So um, in the scripture, he's called the serpent, but he's also known under many other names, Satan, the devil, Diablos, uh, Lucifer, many names. But what it is is a spirit, and the spirit comes in, and it's a lying spirit. One of the names that he's known it as is the father of lies. And so what happens is Eve buys into this. Gang, you've got to stick with me on this front end or nothing else makes sense. Eve buys into this. She buys into the lie that somehow she'll be more valued, more smart, She'll be more like God if she acquiesces her position. And she believed the lie. And at that very moment, what enters in is shame. The Bible says to us in uh, uh, Genesis that they were so shameful when the Lord came to meet them every day like he did in the garden, they hid from him. And he says, why are you hiding? He says, because we're naked. And we're ashamed. And they took these leaves and they hid their <coughs> genitalia. They, and, and they wouldn't come before God. The glory was removed. And it's at this time that you'll see that three curses were given. One, Adam did not cover his wife. And the whole story of the Bible is about a man loving his bride and covering her and rescuing her and redeeming her and restoring her to the rightful position that the enemy stole from her. The, the, next, the next scene that you'll see is um, when they hid themselves, the number one thing that happens is shame, gang. Listen, there's people in here today with shame. Shame, shame is different than guilt. Guilt is I feel bad for what I did. Shame is I feel bad about who I am. And Satan will take you in the darkest places and try to tell you, if they knew you had a pornography problem, if they knew you were raped, if they knew you had an abortion, if they knew you had multiple sex partners, if they knew you had a sex tape somewhere, if they knew that you had a jug problem, if they knew you were hoarding, they wouldn't like you. You wouldn't be like them. So I'm going to suppress you and keep you powerless because you don't know who you are. And so when you look at this, what happened is shame entered the world. And with shame comes great darkness. You, you, if you want to go over that, you can. Oh, he's got to put his glasses on. i got to roll here. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Serpent came to put shame on Adam and Eve to bring the beauty of who they were into great darkness. He took something that was completely pure and made it perverse. And it's so perverse, and we're so steeped in it that we don't even know that it permeates our own souls. When we get to the second point here, the purpose of sex was to be fruitful and expand the family of God. And the real reason, and we spent two messages on this explaining the covenant and how sacred the covenant is and why covenant is so beautiful and how in a woman's vagina there is a hymen. That hymen is so that blood can be shed, so covenant can be made, so that they can become one as God ordained. We spent two sessions, go back two sessions, you can learn about it. It's indispensable, foundational truth, but Satan wants to destroy covenant. So sorry, gang. 
Let's see, I got, I got, I can never wear pretty Sorry. stuff. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. We can't have it. accessories. Okay, whatever. Um, can't wear skirts. Sabotage the message. Well, where, what do I do? I'll lower it. There, How's that? You, there go. you go. Yeah, that's cool. That's okay, cool. so you got the next slide. So here's the number one message that I want you to focus on today. And we'll go over this and over this and over this. And that is? Um, I think this is the uh, uh, question that all of us need to answer for ourselves. Because really on this earth, you're going to have lots of people tell you who you're not. Right? So say you're, you're going to spend the next 60 years on this earth in, in a, negative, a negative world. Um, we're so quick to find the problem and the fault. And again, I go back to what I was saying before about we have to have the answer for the problem because we want to pick sticks off of each other. We want to pick sticks off the beaver dam. You know, there's two gigantic ones that cross in the middle of the beaver dams. You could just pull those out, all the sticks wash downstream. Uh, that's what Jesus does. He pulls those, he wants to pull those two sticks. I was talking to someone this morning. They said, I was reading the Mirror Bible the other day. And I'm like, the Mirror Bible? I've never really heard, there's lots of versions out there, you know, so I've never heard of that we one. So I want, to, uh, I want to jump into that one. But the answer to the question is, who told you that you were naked? The things about what the Bible says about you, um, you have an eternity to believe those things and to frame your world. Or, for 60 years, you can walk powerless on the earth, letting everyone else frame your world for you. I'm going to choose to believe what the Bible says about me, even in the areas of my failures. You know, because when I have, which aren't many, I'll just, I'll just admit. Um, He's so humble. Uh, I am. Um, I'm often pious in my humility. Um, um, when I find things about myself, reading the Mirror Bible, I love that name, um, it's, it's, it becomes, God's revealing something to me. And it's not to squash me ever. He doesn't come for that reason. He comes to restore. Yes. So I ask him this question, how am I to respond to the scripture? Yes. How do I mold my life to fit this? Because this is truth. And we spend a lot of times trying to figure out how to make a scripture fit my life when really I'm supposed to make my life fit the scripture. It's a lot easier that way. You'll wear yourself out the other way, trying to make scripture fit your life. Because we'll go about life um, trying to make things, just adding another thing on in our backpack. You, you see these kids go to school these days, leaning forward because they got an 80-pound backpack on a 50-pound kid. Like that, that's a what I think in my life what I looked like the first part of my Christianity. I was trying to just put on things that were I was supposed to be doing, but I had no power to Fast do it more, because I had more, no, every no interest in changing my life to fit it. But here, here's the deal. Who told you that? Mm -hmm. Who told you that? Who's filling your consciousness about what it looks like to be married, what it looks like to be in relationship, what it looks like to have sex, and what lovemaking is? Because we're going to take a look at this in great detail, but I want to uh, run off of what David said. When you try, you know, the, the scripture says that you built a rock on sand, uh, you built a house on the rock or on sand. Sand conforms. You make, you, make, you make it conform to you. You can get really comfortable in it. You can make it fit around you. But when the storm comes, your house is going to go down. Right. Because you're creating a God. That's idolatry. You're creating a God in your own image that fits what you want. But the rock is firm and steady. If you build on that, you will never be shaken. Mm -hmm. There's a promise there for your life that you will navigate this world no matter what mm -hmm. storm comes. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about who told you that, we're, it, it makes man hide. And what happened is the minute Adam was sold out and um, God came to him, he Get said, mm -hmm. it was the woman mm -hmm. that you gave me that did this. And if we could just reverse for one minute and just suppose that at that time, Adam being so in love with his bride, knowing that he would, he says, Father, I was there too. And I am, I don't even know what possessed me to do it, but it's not her fault. I could have, I could have saved her from this, Father. Forgive us. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what the first Adam couldn't do because sin had entered the world and his glory had been removed. But the second Adam 
came and covers his bride and said, she does not know what she's doing. I will take the punishment for this. Mm -hmm. She will never, ever have to suffer because I will stand in the midst of the anger that brought sin into the world. Amen. And so he was our second Adam. He is protecting. Now, you're that bride. If you're in Christ, you're that bride. You have all the access of heaven. That's why the, 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 the whole story about you know, Christ and being the husband and we being the bride is something that you need to take in so deeply because it's so much about covenant. And as we go on about looking about a man hiding, think about men in church today. Not in this church, hallelujah. Not in a lot of churches because God is flushing the planet right now with his grace. But generally, when you go to church, it's multiple women. It's not a whole lot of men. They're too busy with objects or games or pursuits. They're distracted. They're distracted. They're distracted. That's because they're believing the enemy's lie. We want those men. Well, that and we avoid. You know, Adam had already planned his avoidance tactics for that day because he knew when God was supposed to show up in the garden and he was already hidden. So what we do, men especially, if I can speak to you, is men will avoid what they're bad at or what they perceive they're bad at. Uh, we put a lot of energy, time, and talent into our work because we get accolades there. We see um, immediate feedback via paycheck. Um, but sometimes with uh, serving God, it's a, it's a walking out process, and we don't give it enough time for us to get steady and steadfast of who we really are in God, right? So what we'll start doing is avoiding the perceived um, bad walk. Or you can walk and have a measure of success, and then there is some sort of revert back to whatever it was that you're tangled up with in the past because we'll always revert back to that. The wagon wheel always goes to the rut that we rode in for, uh, long enough. Pete, Peter went back to fishing. If I can use that analogy, it's something that he knew he was good at, he got accolades from, and he could mm -hmm. numb the last three years and try to forget the three years that even though he walked with the Lord for three years and he betrayed him. And, and, you it's, know, and it's something that he avoided. He didn't want to, I mean, he had the opportunity to speak to God about it. Don't know if he did, uh, but he went back to an avoidance tactic, and we do that as guys. You know what I want to get good at doing? Because a lot of people don't even know the story, Peter. Like, we, uh -huh. like we assume that everybody knows these Bible stories. You know some of them. But like if you don't get this, just get the marriage picture. You don't, might not know all these Bible stories, but here's what happened. What set in order at that time when Satan sold out, when, uh, when Eve and Adam sold out, they actually gave the lease of the earth to Satan. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, there was three curses that were given. There was a curse for the serpent. There was a curse for the woman. Hello, preggers in the off, in, in the, I'm sorry about that. There was a curse for the women, and there was a curse for men. And that's not our study today, but I want to focus on what happened with the, with the woman and the serpent. Um, so to the Lord, um, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, um, you will eat the dust of the earth and you will always have enmity with woman between you and the woman and between her offspring. It is at that time that Satan started an all out campaign to crush degrade and humiliate women as much as he could. Any society, listen to me, that um, doesn't celebrate women never succeeds. Any society that tries to, look at your Muslim nations, look at the countries in Brazil where they're throwing acid on women because they, the man has sex with many people and she got upset. Any society that does not honor women is going to be crushed. And we, ladies, luckily are born into a dispensation in a time where we can be heard. Because 50 years ago, this would have been a violation. To this day, people walk in this room and still feel like this is a violation. But the truth is, at the cross, all men, all Jews, all Gentile, all women become the same in Christ. Amen. And he is using everybody for this time, mm -hmm. whosoever will. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at this, Wherever women are treated with love and respect, that society will flourish. And you can look across the board. We can have a long conversation about that. But the next, um, the next clip, this is what I want you to understand before you leave today. 1 John 5.19 says that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. How did that happen? Remember when Jesus and Satan were in the garden battling back and forth after 40 days of fasting? And... Satan says to Jesus, the son of God, the son of man, deity himself, he said, he says, he said, come up on this lofty hill and look down because I can give all of this to you because it was given 
to me. Mm -hmm. He's in charge for just a small time. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is in this particular scripture, he said that um, we know it's under the control of the evil one. We also, uh, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true, even the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Now, you wouldn't argue with me at all about mm -hmm. the whole world being under the evil one in the financial area, in the governmental area, in the health education area, in the healthcare uh, area. When we talk today about sex, you better know that that domain has been taken over. I need a remnant who's strong, who's sure, who's right in the middle of God's will, and, and just pull the rug out from under his feet because that's what opportunity we have here. Look at what TV, for me it was happy days, it was father knows best, we can go back a little Ooh, older. <laughs> but now, <laughs> we're way back. Maybe not back But now far, it's but... Californication, it's sex in the city. These are four beautiful girls having sex with whoever they will and we're entertained greatly by it and find our delight in a psychology, in a philosophy that is nothing but great darkness. Mm -hmm. And we are are so desensitized by it that we don't even know what's going on. This, and I don't mean I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna shake you up a this little bit. Everything. This is on all those games that you're saying that are subjectifying and objectifying women, the games that you're playing on music. And I'm gonna say to you right day, to, to, today, on your iPod, if there's a song that says bitch or whore in it, you need to take it off today. Today, by the end of the day. That is what has happened. We are so permeated that when you get to these pictures and you see how we're being objectified and how women are being crushed, this is where we need to make some changes. You need to ask yourself, search me, Lord. Look inside of me. Is there anywhere that I've added? I've, I, I've allowed myself to be permeated by something that is so violating. And your eyes, make a covenant with your eyes that you will not behold any evil or vile thing. Amen. And you say, you know, some of you guys in here, I don't feel sorry for you. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, I do feel sorry for you. <laughs> I do feel sorry for you. We're working Please. on our compassion. <laughs> <laughs> we, you just, you got it tough, man. There's nowhere where your eyes can't go. I want you to listen to some of the testimonies that you're going to hear today. I need you. You know how I know when a guy's delivered? I have one of my leaders here who I adore. And, you know, in our pastoral counseling, as they're coming into such incredible power, um, uh, they said, you know, I used to look, I used to like to look at naked ladies. I don't do that anymore. I realize, you know, hiding in the church, living in this area that keeps you powerless, and you guys have to know that we know that you're subjected. So it's not a secret. If we can talk about it, we can get the shame out of it, we can get the power in it, you can get delivered and be really happy. Amen. Very powerful. Um, Satan tells lies, and all we're going to be able to handle today is we're going to talk about youth and sing, uh, singles. Next week, we're going to tell about the lies that he tells to all of us, to women and men, mm -hmm. based on sex. And then we're going to wrap up sex timber. I know, aren't you sad? A little sad? No all? Nothing? No. Okay. Why not? Oh. <laughs> um, the first lie that he'll tell youth is, is that it isn't really sex if you don't have intercourse. President Clinton? Okay. <laughs> So fondling, uh, petting genitalia, um, uh, oral sex is very, very common nowadays. And the girls and the guys don't think that that's violating, except for um, if you're in here today and any of that has taken place, I just got the best news for you about restoration because I want to come forth by telling you I didn't come to David in this pristine way. I wasn't taught. I didn't know my value. I bought into the lie. I didn't know the truth. And as a result of not knowing the truth, I subjugated myself to a system that would grind me right into the ground. Right. And so I can't find it um, unusual that our teens are not seeing this everywhere. How could you not watch TV? How could you not watch the music videos? Come on, gang, somebody, no amens, not one amen. So I'm telling you that Matthew 5 says, and Jesus says, this is in, in the New Testament, he says, if you look on a woman lustfully, and everybody's like, I am so guilty. You have already committed adultery in your heart. Here's the posture that you take now. God, Jesus, is the best accountability partner on the planet. He knows what you're dealing with. Just take it to him and say, Lord, 
I don't want to lust. I, have, I want you to provide for me the woman of which I will find my delight in my youth in. Amen. And I, want, I also want to establish that um, if, in fact, you do lust, what you want to say is, God, I, don't, I want to see her as my sister or my mother. I want to see her as my sister or my mother. Because that's what Paul tells his youngest pastor, Timothy. He says, when you look at these women, you need to look at them as either a mother or a sister, unless God grants you a beautiful wife. And then have at it and have fun. But up until that point, you're going to have to show some self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Of the spirit. And if the Spirit is in you, guess what you got? All the fruit. All the fruit. You got it. And so, but if you don't exact it, if you don't talk about it, if you don't tell yourself, I have self-control in this area, Jesus said I did, it's a fruit of the Spirit, and I'm exercising it. And by the way, you're going to be tempted. Mm -hmm. You're going to be tempted. And the, the main flow or crux behind the Scripture that Jesus was saying, if you looked at someone in your heart lustfully or with intent, then you've committed adultery already. Um, the main flow behind that is that Jesus knows, the Lord knows, that whatever we entertain, for long enough, and see the Bible uses the word um, a practice. There's a difference of practicing something and falling into something. Do you know that? You practice it like you have intent to practice. Okay, Jesus was saying that the more you put before your eyes and allow in your heart for you to mull over, if you practice that long enough, you will act on it. It will, will master you. It will, yeah. it will manifest in your life. And it seeks to, uh, to, to master you. In pornography, um, I've watched videos and talked to people who were bound by por pornography. I have viewed pornography as a young man, um, but it, it never, it, it kind of never, I wasn't bent toward that, you know? We all have our bents toward different things. Um, and there are people who it mastered. I mean, that's all they thought about all day and couldn't wait to get home, and so they could view it, you know? And, and so, such shame comes with that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Gigantic. So I was talking to, she's not in here, hallelujah. I was talking to Savannah the other night, my oldest uh, granddaughter. And I said, uh, do your friends talk about sex? You know, popcorn hits the floor and she just looks at me. <laughs> and I'm like, um, so he says, she says, sometimes. I said, well, what do they say? She goes, I'm not comfortable in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, get comfortable, sister, because we're going to talk about this. Um, and I think if it gets, if we open it up in our homes a little yeah. more and more yeah. in a casual not a uh, casual but serious manner, it will become open. Whatever is revealed and whatever is open is not secretively acted on anymore. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing it to bring shame or to bring any kind of guilt or anything like that. I'm doing it to say, I love you, I'm concerned, and this is the proper operating procedure that God's laid down And we'll down bring it into the light. If yeah. you bring it into the light, everything get, can get healed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, when my kids were younger and they were going through when testosterone comes in, and, and, and if you, many of you have already visited this time, in puberty, when testosterone comes in, everything changes, and you have no idea. And I told them to expect erections out of nowhere. If you're uncomfortable, this is September. Ex expect that you are going to have incredible surges. What happens at night? The Bible calls it nocturnal emissions. That means at night they'll have an ejaculation when they're sleeping. If you don't give your kids an understanding on how to deal with that, they're going to hide it because they don't know what's going on. And we need to have an open conversation with it because God owns this. This is awesome. We are going to bar mitzvah you because you're going to be your man now. Okay? That's why they do that. And they teach the, that child that his seed is precious. And that seed doesn't go anywhere except for where God said to plant it. Amen? Amen. It doesn't go here, there, and everywhere and go try it out. And these are some of the lies that we're believing. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at this, you got the Holy of Holies. You Ooh. missed it. Go I back. I missed it. Missed yeah. the Holy of Holies. Your body is the temple of the <laughs> Holy Spirit. Um, just th think of it this way. Bless you. I just want to say the comparison yeah. that he's making with this, and it's not unusual because in the Old Testament, the temple was where they would go and meet with God. And so his presence would fill that, and they would have intimate contact. In, this, um, in the New Testament, he says, Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which right. dwells in you. Mm -hmm. He says, How can you lay your body with a prostitute? Mm -hmm. Don't you know that, the, that you, Christ is with you when you do that? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a great analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so they had uh, outer court, inner court, um, and the Holy of Holies um, in the temple. 
you have the same thing as well in your body. For example, um, when I'm living everyday life, um, people can touch me in certain places. My arms, that, you know, you shake hands with people all the time. You don't want people touching, you know, my face. So that would be the, the inner court kind of come up and touch your face and get or right in chest. your face. Or my chest area or my <laughs> rear end. You know, that's only you for me. That's, <laughs> and that, a doctor. That's, that's, yeah, that, and my mom. My mom. My mom turned 80 Tuesday, went down, took her out to dinner, and she passed me on the rear end. I'm like, okay, like, that's great. You've seen it before. So. Um, and then the Holy of Holies, only one. See, the one priest could go into the Holy of Holies and then only once a year. And that's where I draw the line about her, um, me and her entering the Holy of Holies. You know, once a year, that's not a good thing. Um, but only she can go there. That's, that's, that is the place that only she can go. God has reserved that for the intimacy of marriage. Okay, let me take it a little deeper because that's what I do. Um, remember that there was a veil that separated the outer court and then you go into the inner court where there was the communion and the mm -hmm. light, the menorah, and then there was a veil that you had to open in order to go in. Is it not the most beautiful thing that it's the same thing that we do in weddings when we remove the veil, I now allow you into the Holy of Holies. It's the same thing when I talked about the hymen, that that's a veil that is split when you come into the Holy of Holies. It is magnificent. Mm -hmm. It is majestic. It is divine. When we do it God's way, we would not be in the place that we are. Mm -hmm. When I minister to people in my office who have given themselves, I, I was just talking to a beautiful young Christian girl she was dating a, a guy. She had her purity ring on for two years, and um, they broke up. And so one night she was just being crazy, and she went out with this guy and the whole group of friends, but they got, side, they got sidetracked, and she went out. And before she knew it, they were in a place that they shouldn't have been, and he forced himself on her. Because she was a Christian, she was so ashamed. She couldn't tell anyone. She has lived, in, as God is my witness, for two years under condemnation. They put her on Prozac because she was so grieved about what happened to her. And she said, since it's happened, it doesn't matter anymore. I'm not clean. I'm not valuable. That's a lie from hell as well. Mm -hmm. I restored her in my office, gave her back her beauty, took the shame away from what happened, and asked her now to go help young girls everywhere understand how quickly this can happen. Now, let me say to you, I know that we have a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Do you see the, the young girls now? Mm -hmm. They don't know that putting the push-up bras and Victoria Principles. I know what Victoria's secret is. I just want to say. But um, Victoria Principles. Uh, secret. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Who's principal? That's old. That's, that's old, right? That's Dallas. That's Dallas. That's stuff. Dallas. Yeah. That was like regression right yeah. there. Okay. <laughs> Victoria's secret is, is an issue. Only old people laughed at that. Everybody's like, what are they talking about? Um, <laughs> um, the, the idea that we subjugate these people on a daily basis to this, this is their new normal. And unless somebody tells them how magnificent, how beautiful, oh, how yeah. purposeful they are, and that's us, gang, we get to tell them. And we can tell them, we can tell them pre or post sex. Mm -hmm. Say, I, I didn't know this truth, but the minute I did, I gave my body to God. I asked them to purify it. I confessed to the one that I loved that I did not save myself for you. I'm sorry that I didn't. I wish I knew you were coming and that I trusted God. But from this day forward, my mind, my heart, and my body is yours as long as we're in covenantal commitment. Yeah, I, I had many categories in my life when I came to the Lord because I didn't know. I, I just didn't know. And I told him as he revealed things to me, you know, or things would come to me that after I'd gotten saved, um, I would just tell him I didn't know that. I'm, so, sorry. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mm -hmm. know. But he make, listen, either he makes all things new or he doesn't. And right? he does. Second Corinthians says that you're a new crea creation. Mm -hmm. You're a new creature. So whatever's past is past. Just let that go. Yeah. Don't live in the condemnation, but move forward and say, thank you for that newness, Lord. Thank Amen. you that it's new again. So this is about the lures of his lies. Now, women today, and we're talking about women, men are next week, but women today, especially our youth, are luring people with their dress. Mm -hmm. So if you want to lure guys in with your body, you're going to get body snatchers. Mm -hmm. right. Okay? That's what they're going to look for. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you, I'm looking at a lot of church folks here. Look, I don't need you to judge the girl who's doing that with her body. I need you to love the girl that's doing that with her body Amen. and bring her into the love, joy, peace, patience that we have 
with the favor of God in our lives, not the judgment of God in our lives. We need to go to those who are scantily clad and cover them and talk to them and befriend them and defend them when somebody talks down about them or says, she's just the huzzy. She just wants to give it away. You can't be a part of that conversation. It's not good or bad. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Everything's good and bad. We bring the light. Mm -hmm. We bring the truth. Mm -hmm. And once they hear their value, once they taste and see that the Lord is good, and once they see there's a resident joy that comes in serving God, guess what happens? They repent. They change their mind about what the world was teaching them. The whole world is under the control of the evil one. But 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God burst through through Jesus Christ and is accessible to us today. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. Rise up, kingdom. Rise up. Let's go get our girls back. Let's go get our girls back. Amen? So a uh, lure. No, oh, I got a hand clap. One clap. Whoa. whoa. Woo -woo. <laughs> so another lure that's um, thrown out to our youth today is you only have sex with people you love. This is kind of a pressure, um, pressure, pressure pitch, and probably more from guys than girls. Although, um, if you watch, if you watch enough of talk show TV, I'd watched something the other day on um, not Paul Harvey, um, Steve Harvey. <laughs> You're so old. Steve Harvey has Holy a cow. <laughs> Steve Harvey has a show now. He's a comedian, and but he had a really serious um, talk and had a psychologist on who interviewed like these four or five young guys and asked them really candid questions and they answered them and they were all about sex and relationship. And so our society has taught these young, ca young kids, real good kids, good kids, yeah. good meaning kids, but they've been taught by society. And so they've adopted these societal um, uh, mandates and, and, and uh, thought processes where they said casually and with great conviction that if, uh, if you don't have intercourse, intercourse is not, um, foreplay to them, or foreplay is not intercourse. It is a, uh, it's just a natural thing that they do at parties or whatever, and you only have love, or you only make love with uh, people that you love, or you only have sex with people that you love, and they thought it was okay. Um, if Usually young kids, 16, 17-year-old, the person that they're dating at the moment is not their life partner. They're not going to be their the person that they married, you know that? It's I mean, hard to tell 16 Yeah, it's hard that. to tell 16. Remember, remember back when you were mm -hmm. 16 and 17, that we mm -hmm. called it puppy love back then, you know, and no one can tell you any different. Oh, I'm going to marry this girl. This, the, this is the one, you know, and then three weeks later, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're an idiot. But, but uh, <laughs> um, and you don't know that. I mean, your mother and father become we're the smartest. We're going to talk about the purpose of dating right here in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your mother and father become the smartest people on the planet when you're 25, <laughs> not when you're 17 and 18. Yeah. I, have a, I have a plaque on my desk that says, uh, um, teenager, please move out quickly so while you know everything and make your own way in life. Because you know, I have a lot of tours where I work and the kids come in and they see that and they're like, oh, that's kind of stupid. I remember oh. one of my kids, I won't name them. Um, you only have two, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you can well, guess. I'm looking, I'm not, he's not, he, I am looking at him in this room. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, he, uh, he says, Mom, you don't trust me. I'm like, you're right, I don't trust you. I'm going to smell your breath, check your phone, listen to your music, get in your glove compartment. I don't trust you. you got brains like mush right now. You need some help right. so that you can form and gently go into the world and make it, son, because I love you. I don't yeah. trust you. And he did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's listen to Jacob's story. Will you run that video? Let's see a, a young man's testimony here. And uh, might take a second to bring that up. Oh. So um, we intended to have a round table where we could have a lot of people ask questions. And Peace for us, you fools. At 12 years old, I had my first sexual relationship, and that's young. I didn't even know, you know, what, you know, purity was. I wasn't in church. It distorted my view of what a relationship should be, what a biblical relationship should be. As a man and just as a human being, I mean, it, it intensified that struggle to stay pure from that point on for the rest of my life. And, uh, I mean, I'm proud to say I did it, but it was it was hard every single day of my life from that point. Making that one mistake, you know, when I was younger, it'll, I mean, I'll always have that with me no matter what. Scared to death on my wedding day. I absolutely petrified because my wife's sitting there walking down the aisle being a clean, pure 
purified person. She's waited her whole life for me, and I, I can't say that. I was bawling my eyes out because, you know, it, I'm pure now through Christ, but, I mean, I did something that I can never take back to make myself, you know, as ready as she was for that day. Teenagers who are easily influenced grab onto the wrong thing and not have a real sense of what's right and what's wrong. My parents are great, you know, don't get me wrong, great parents, but we just, I don't know if it was uncomfortable for them or, you know, but we never actually had the talk. I just kind of got knocked around and learned and we just want to sweep it under the rug and it's become like the thing you don't talk about, the, the hidden secret, the hidden sin that you're not supposed to discuss with anybody. It's a bad word and like, you know, this is something you don't do. No, sex is a beautiful thing, absolutely. I mean, God created it for our enjoyment when we were married. And I think people have become uncomfortable talking about it because they just get this misconception that somehow sex is evil and stuff. But no, it's just misused. We're so scared of what people think of us and too prideful to let people help us that we decided, like, you know, we can deal with this on our own, think you can deal with this on your own. And in fact, God says you can't deal with this on your own. You can't fix yourself. And even you and God, by yourself, you have to get people to help you and support you and acknowledge your sin. You know, I could still do this and make it and everything was going to be okay eventually. Always hope for you and there's always, I mean, God's forgiven you if you've asked for it. The church has got to quit being ignorant to the fact that their own body of believers is hurting and needs help. They have thought that maybe if we just leave the subject alone that maybe things will fix itself, they'll learn how to do it the right way. When truthfully, the only way to ever teach them how it's properly done is to come right out front and say it and have talks with them and show them, look, this is the biblical way of having a relationship. This is the biblical way of talking about things. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee from sexual immorality, for all other sins are out of the body, but sexual immoral person sins against his own body. The best thing you ever can do is just sit down and be honest with your children. I'm Jacob Chestnut. I play bass for Rush of Fools, and I'm so blessed to be with Freedom Against here. The thing that impacted me the most about this is that we uh, um, we are the containers of truth, yeah. and uh, then they want to talk about this. You know, people want to talk about Christ, but we're afraid we're going to be rejected. And really, uh, we should respect our religion uh, and Jesus a little more than to keep our mouth closed when really the world wants to hear what we have to say. Uh, if you do it in love, you're not going to miss. You're mm -hmm. just not going to miss. Mm -mm. Um, uh, Penn and, you know who Penn and Teller is? Okay, this, he had this uh, friend that he was speaking with, and he said uh, that the, he, he had this conversation with this guy um, for a long, long time, and, and then he found out he was a Christian. He goes, he didn't respect his religion even enough to tell me about it. Mm -hmm. And so people find out we're Christians. We play that Secret Service badge real quick, you know, um, for somebody. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian just in passing or whatever it I is, but we're, we're not... Um, and we're not engaging, I believe, in to answer the questions that people really have. But I, I, I think it's really important, too, and I think we need to do some training on this. Yeah. I think it's not about, like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. You know, it's not about that. You become freaky, 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 freaky. What it is is Jesus didn't come into a room and say, Messiah's here, Messiah, Messiah. He yeah. didn't do that. What he did is he loved them. Mm -hmm. He loved them. And then by his love, it's by love. And when the scripture says that it was kindness that leads them, them to repentance. Yeah. It's not bashing. It's not, you know, I'm not against tracks. I think tracks are really lovely. But before you hand somebody a track, maybe serve them in some way. I think a track wrapped in a $100 bill is a great <laughs> at, a, at a table. We it's, used to do that when we would leave. We'd leave a huge not tip. Not a track that looks like a $100 bill. Yeah, you've no, seen, we, would use, we would leave a huge tip in books. Um, we had this little book that would talk about the power of God. Everybody here has got one if you've been with us here for a little while. Um, anyway, th we want to talk about singles now for a second. And I, I know we're already long way past what we wanted to get done today. But... Um, Singles, Satan lies to them about um, the more sexually experienced you are before you get ma married, the better it is. And, in other words, go out and taste and see and, and, and try, you know, how you, you know, people say you, you don't want to buy the car until you test drive it. No, here's the deal. You, <laughs> are, <good. That's> <laughs> you are learning from the world, and that hurts you. You know, again, in my office, I'll meet 
I'll meet girls who have given their bodies many, many times. Now they can't trust. They, they've, they've gone through divorce because in their heart they're broken. There's a shame that comes along with this. Can I just talk about abortion for a minute? This is just an, um, an inconvenient way to go out and do exactly what God said don't do. And, and, and it's not any condemnation. If you've had an abortion, I tell you by the name of Jesus that you are cleansed and you are forgiven Amen. and there is no condemnation and you will raise that child in heaven. But now with your life, let lead people to love. You know, when I think about, we've said this before, when a guy goes into a room and watches pornography, whatever it is, R-rated movie, whether ever it's, it's one of those movies where a girl's real subjectified or a game, and you watch that for an hour, you don't know that in your mind you become, you make them objectified. You make them, they become a certain way in the way that you view, view things. If you watch an hour of pornography or you listen to an amazing teacher, teaching for an hour, there's two different positions that you'll have when you leave that room. One, you're going to come out to get something and, and get as much as you can, lust. The other one is you're going to come out and want to give. Now, I don't intend that you never lust, but you've got to lust for your wife, who you're committed to, who you'll never leave, never forsake, whether she's good, whether she's bad. You're going to commit yourself to her in a safe covenantal marriage, and that's where you're going to have the best sex of your life. Amen. It's not going to be, amen. amen. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be going and, you know, going around and trying to figure out who loved you. I mean, it messes you up. I, if there's anybody in here that can testify, I don't want you to come up and testify, but here's what I'm saying. <laughs> but I mean, like, like yes, a, a, an amen would be good here because I know what it did to me. I know the shame and the degradation that it did to me. After I saw how beautiful it was, I had no idea, zero idea. My father was born to pornography. He had his way with me from the time I was six years old to 14. And so I had no idea. I had no respect for my body. He didn't have any respect for my body. He, they, that was the leader of my life. There's many, many girls in this situation, many girls, many boys. More than ever, homosexuality is so pervasive. They've been molested. And then they, I have a testimony I'm going to play for you next week that's going to open your heart. We want all homosexuals. We want all fornicators. We want all liars. We want all idolaters Adulterers. right in this church. Mm -hmm. I want them. I want them. I want them. Because once they find who Jesus is and what he did for them, they too can be free like me. Amen. Hallelujah. Because if you remember when you got saved, you weren't getting saved because of whatever bent that you had that you sinned. You were getting saved because you realized who he was in your life. And so I needed Jesus in my life to fix me. They need Jesus in their life to fix them. They're just looking for another thing to fix them. I looked for cars and stereo and, or whatever it was, different relationships. Um, and that wasn't the thing that was going to fill the void that was in my life. I think all of us have that. It's created in us. It fell away from the garden. We, became, uh, uh, we walked away from the awareness of God. But there is a chamber in our heart that only he can fulfill. Every desire that you have on this planet, there is a solution for or a fulfillment for. If you're hungry, it's food. If you're thirsty, it's water. If you're cold, we have clothes on. We have a house because it rains. There is something that will fulfill every need that we have. we got to go somewhere. We have a car. It used to be a horse. Thank God for progress. Mm -hmm. uh, no. I want to. Uh, don't end me. Are you going to end me? Oh, I'm going to end you. Don't end me. No. End no. Okay, so what the world says to men. See, I hate when it goes so slow. Okay, single men. Sex before marriage deepens our intimacy. Men want the convenience of marriage without commitment. David and I lived together before we were married for two years. And I fully intended to do that for the rest of my life. That is exactly what my mother and my father did. Mm -hmm. They never were married. I never saw wedding pictures. I was a bastard child when my father died at 17 because uh, we, my mother wasn't <coughs> married to him. She was not going to get his very pitiful life insurance policy. They had to give it to the kids. You talk about no honor, no respect, no nothing. So I want you to know that this again, who told you that? Who told you that? God did not tell you that. When you honor and love a woman and you say, I love her with all my heart, you're going to honor her in front of the presence of your family and your community, and you're going to stand in front of them and you're going to say, this woman I pledge to take care of, to love, provide for better, for worse, in fatness, in thinness, and everything that comes along, I'm going to be her man. From this day forward, you can trust my leadership. That is love. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen?
I got all these married girls back here. Okay. Women will stay in a relationship or put up with that kind of relationship in order to keep the man happy, in order to placate, they're afraid if that you will. He, they're, they're afraid, afraid he's going to leave. leave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have a guy in my, in my, in, and lady in my um, life right now that I talk to him all the time about getting married because they're living together. And he says, uh, she doesn't want to get, she likes the lifestyle that we have. She doesn't want to get married. And I assure him, every little girl wants to get married. Mm -hmm. They've been planning it since they were four. Mm -hmm. If you watch them play with their dolls, they are getting those dolls married. <laughs> and they are planning that they know what it looks like. There's a YouTube video about a girl getting a Ken doll. She says, I, I got a man. I got a man. I've been needing so the man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so they can play dress But there's up. a spirit that comes with that. It's called the spirit of cohabitation. Mm -hmm. And it, um, if you are good enough, it, it, it's about you're in a divorce type of situation. Yeah, you're if you don't it. perform mm -hmm. and do what I want you to do, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And that happens a whole lot. And you never can be safe and secure. Mm -hmm. And again, covenant says for better, for worse, mm -hmm. till death do us part. Mm -hmm. um, somebody told you wrong. Mm -hmm. if, you're <laughs> if you got any other information, and I want you to know that his promises are good. They're, they're, they're sweet. If you taste and see, you know, I'll tell you why we turn off the world. Because there's two types of community. There's a community that goes out and reconciles itself, that walks the community to see what the needs are and brings the, the helping hand. We actually bring heaven to earth. That's what Jesus said that we do. We give them answers. We're not a community that is joyless and goes out judging and telling everybody what they're doing wrong and what they won't do and what they won't be a part of and what they can't watch. I think that, that that's tired and played out, and I want you to know something. This is not that place. You won't fit here because I want you to understand when homosexuals come, I expect this church to embrace them, love them, and be part of the community with them. When people who come who are fornicating and living with each other, and you may be here now and we have people in this church, I want the same thing. We all are in several different levels of being matured and being turned from glory to glory. But this is where the sick and the bruised and the liars and the misfits come. This is where you're made whole. This is the training ground for that. And churches everywhere should be doing this. Churches should be taking back sex because it's God's. It's not the world's. Don't you wish you got some of this information when you're younger? Any yeah. amen? Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. Got one. Amen. Hallelujah, sister. So, good statement. Intimacy is not sex, and here's why we made this statement. Um, if you use sex as a part of making up or solving your problems, and people do this, mm -hmm. you're always going to have to do that. You're sex has always got to be the answer. Sex is the answer to if everything. If that was the answer, Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt would still be together. <laughs> I gotta think about that for a moment. Well, no, they're the two most gorgeous people on the planet. They probably had great sex, but they're not together today because they didn't have covenant. They don't understand that it can't be about sex. That gets old. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I mean, it's good. It's just old. <laughs> so, so under that guise, then the, the reason the reason for dating, we, we taught our kids that the reason for dating is for you to go to see if you're compatible and you can walk with Christ together. If you find out, you know, I'll change him. How many people have you talked to that say, well, I thought he would change because I was a Christian. And they, got, they pressed forward and got married. They're not going to change. In fact, if you don't, again, if you don't respect your Jesus enough to do that, he's not going to change because you're telling him, yes, I accept you the way you are. You, you need to take a stance and say, this is what you need to happen to date me. That, that's what we, we try to teach our sons to do. We taught them that you don't go out on a date and taste each other to see if you're compatible. Mm -hmm. that's, not what you, that's not what dating is about. If you're on the third date and you're sitting across from the person and you're finding out information and you're saying that I can't spend the rest of my life with this person, you have no reason to date amen. them again. Amen and amen. If you're not going in the same direction, there is no use in trying to put your goodness on somebody and think you're going to change them. Because bad company corrupts good behavior, I have a, not the other way around. I have uh, clients, Hindu and Christian, I said neither one of them respected their religions enough to right. really make a stand. How are you going to raise your kid? Mm -hmm. Christians? I mean, how does that work? It doesn't. Gang, it doesn't. That's why the Bible teaches us to be, on, don't be unequally yoked. Not because you're good and they're not, just because you can't serve two different gods. You just can't. Mm -hmm. There's tons more to learn about this. We have one more testimony I want you to listen to, and then here's what I want you to understand. 
you have a brand new start in Christ. Every day his mercies are new. Amen. If you're bound in a soul tie with somebody who you have affections for outside of your marriage, stop it. Get in relationship with somebody and talk about it so Amen. that we can get you out of the woods because that's just going to drive you right into the ground. If you're a man and you're watching pornography, stop it. It's stealing all your power. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel condemned. You don't even know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk about hoarding and gambling and drug taking. All those things are all distractions as well, but this is September, so that's why we're talking about sex. I want you to understand that in Christ, full redemption has been made. We go as ambassadors to say, hey, God's not mad. He's reconciled the world, forgiving you all of your sins, not counting anybody's sin against, against them. them. Okay, hang on, gang. Everybody in the world is in a state of salvation, but not everybody has been redeemed. Mm -hmm. For the entire world was saved. God so loved the world, not the church. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The whole world is saved, but they don't know it because we got to be the ones to tell them. We are the ambassadors from heaven that go and tell them that your price has been paid. You don't have to pay. Amen. You need to come and taste and see that he's good. Mm -hmm. Come into our community. Look at the way we love each other in spite of each other. We do things wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect pastors. We're not perfect people, and neither are you. But we are committed to the cause of Christ, Amen. and every one of us want to be like him more and more each day. Amen. Good, 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 good. Go I'm Jimmy, and I'm an ambassador of Christ disguised as a musician. <laughs> My greatest fear, okay, I'm just going to say it because I wish it was something deep like death. My greatest fear now is honeybees and wasps, which is a lot like death to me in that inevitably I would probably die if, was, if I was stung, but, um, but probably a little bit less dramatic than actually dying. I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. We were religious at best. I didn't learn about uh, sex from my parents, that's for sure. I f was first exposed to the idea of it uh, in fourth grade, uh, which is tragic. I was nine years old. Uh, I, all my friends were always older than me. They invited me over one day and, and said, hey, we got something we want to show you. And brought out a, a picture of this from this magazine. and. I was like, wow, this is uh, not anything that I've seen before. That was kind of the beginning of my captivity. It was the beginning of this long affair with, with um, pornography that wouldn't end till um, mid-college for me. Over the years, uh, as my heart just got more and more drawn to it, I would uh, I would find that I needed it more and more. Nobody knew anything. I thought that I was the only person in the world who uh, was even involved in this sort of stuff. At this point in my life, I was an addict. I mean, I was, uh, I couldn't go a day without it. It consumed me to the core. There was this moment, the beginning of my sophomore year, uh, that happened. It was the first time that I felt a hollowness when I would run to the internet or run to a magazine or whatever. Why isn't this satisfying like I thought it would? Praise God, I, I had one friend in high school who, who was actually walking with God. And I just told him everything, spilled my guts to him, you know. And I don't ever remember uh, weeping that bitterly over anything in my life. He began to articulate to me this hope that uh, I wouldn't have to walk in sin anymore and that I could find uh, freedom um, from my captor. That night when I went home, it was like this celebration. I got rid of my um, all the material that I had. I, I threw away the CDs, the DVDs. I thought, I get saved, I'm free from porn uh, addiction. It didn't get easier, it, it got harder because now I was fighting. And praise God that he's got me to a place where finally through a long journey, fully liberated me from uh, from pornography. We're a bunch of screw-ups and, and half-hearted, apathetic, you know, addicted people that God is making new daily. God is not okay with a half-hearted pursuit of Him. It really begins with, with an open confession of just going, hey, I messed up. I need help. And that's a tough thing, man. It 
to talk about it means I'm ready to deal with it myself. And it is, it's a little weird, isn't it? I mean, that, that I would openly talk about, you know, pornography on, on stage at a church. I, I get that. But who else is going to if I don't? The things that we keep in darkness, God makes it very clear, He intends to bring them to the light. You can't beat it, but someone else has in your place. And that person was Christ. And that place was the cross. I'm Jimmy Needham. I'm an ambassador. Hello. Let freedom begin here. I want to tell you something. This kid was loved out of that issue, and that's what this church does. I have a testimony next week um, about somebody who was gripped with homosexuality and, and the deception of what that is. And we'll, we'll talk about that at length. Everybody, you've been told many things, but I have to take you to the Bible and what the Bible says. And here's the deal. He was loved in the middle of a struggle. He said, they loved me to my, my redemption. They loved me. That's all I want to do, gang. I don't care about fancy nothing. I don't care about nothing but Jesus' reward. And he's out on the street. So we're not coming here to get fat and filled and talk about how good each other are. Right. Go get his reward and mm -hmm. tell him the truth. Bring him here. Let's train him. And let's send them back out. And we'll do it again and we'll do it again. And then I'm going to go to heaven and I'll see you there. <laughs> and not like soon or anything, but just. But um, he's going to read a scripture. We're going to bless you. Are you full? Did you get anything out of it? All right. Because you look a little numb, actually. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> we, we, you get a little full. Um, sometimes when we are sharing, sharing together, we overfeed. Uh, yeah, I'm saying, okay, don't, don't, don't interject anything else new, or I'm going <laughs> to pop. It's like a tick that's locked onto a dog and filling up. <laughs> Sorry for that analogy. I don't know where that came from. That was, that was, that was a little gross. Um, so let me read scripture because we didn't have a lot of scripture in this teaching, and the word is the only thing that washes us and changes us, and then we will depart, and the girls can go watch football, and the guys will go to Alden Malls or something like that. So in 2 Corinthians, if you'll write this down, 5, and it's 14 uh, through chapter 6, verse 2, and kind of read this through the week because we're going to go hit this a little more next week detail. because it's a very uh, important scripture for what we're talking about. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. So if you're dead, I'm okay, I'm not going to expound. Mm -hmm. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Oh, I have to click here too, mm -hmm. don't I? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do it from here. I'll do it. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Listen, guys, I don't have anything against anyone. anyone. But I do have something against that thing sitting on their shoulder. You with me? Okay. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Just praise the Lord right mm. there. No sin. No You're sins. sinless. We're, awesome. we're, we're not picking sins. We're just being reconciled to Christ, right? And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you, implore you on Christ's sake or his behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What's that one? That's it. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So instead of us approaching or praying from the position or living our life from the position of us trying to get something, maybe we can change positions and know that we're coming from a position that's already been done for us. And that every resource that's in heaven is available to us. Amen. And maybe we're not using all the resources mm -mm. that's been died for us and given to us. That we are already sons. We're not picking off lint. We're not choosing sins to point to somebody else and say these sins are accounted to you. Because the scripture says that they've already been died for. The only sin that we're given account for when we go to heaven is what we did with Jesus Christ. Because the other stuff has been paid for. But what did you do with my son? You know... I want to just say this, and then we're going to let you go. Um, here's the no. deal. You are, if you're in Christ, you are the bride of Christ. 
and anybody who's ever been in love, a wife knows that she can get anything out of her husband that she wants. <laughs> And I want you to understand that well, you need to stop. No, I mean, you know, because of our love for each other, not manipulation. But because, because your lack of identity, the Bible says that uh, he's coming for a bride without spot or without wrinkle. And for so long it's been trained in the church that we got to get our, we're wrinkled and spotted. No, you're not. He already sees You've us. been made clean. Amen. He already sees you mm-hmm. as righteous. Mm-hmm. He's, he, and, and I want you to understand that we need to stop praying about need. I need, I need, I need. You need to start in, take, praying from a position of inheritance, mm-hmm. pulling exactly into the situation with authority and understanding who you are and really moving the area that he's given you. This is the area that he's given us. Mm-hmm. We're not in Houston. We're not in New York. We're in Greencastle. We own this. All the resources that we need to help Jesus flourish here have been given to us. I just need the bride to start praying out and praying down and using her inheritance in this area and getting busy about loving people the way Jesus did. Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were sick and oppressed of the devil. That's what we do. Let's stand. Amen. Amen. So, Father, thank you for the word that's in us. Thank you for, um, thanks for loving us. Yeah. Just before we even knew that all this was going to happen, that you loved us enough to pin your words because your words are eternal. It doesn't matter what I think about a situation and what I feel about a situation. It matters what you've already said about every situation that I'm ever going to encounter. So, Father, thank you for giving me the instruction manual of this Maserati yes. and help me to align my life to it and not think that the manufacturer is just trying to control me of how much air I put in my tires, but how much you love us and that you're smarter than I am. Uh, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room, in other words. So, Father, thank you for uh, the hope that we have in you, in our salvation that we walk in. Thank you, Father, for your great love in Jesus' name. We'd love to pray with you. We have a great prayer team. If you want to pray, if you want to talk, I just, I'm kind of excited for where God's taken us. And uh, just even, even if you have any questions, we're up here for you. We love you. Be blessed. It's Sunday. Go enjoy the beautiful weather. Amen.